Hi guys, welcome back to Project Jones. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how this small aquaponic system works. The interest for aquaponics started a few years ago. It was something that I was interested in, something that I really wanted to try and do. I was, I was considering doing it at home. Normally, Aquaponics is reserved for Southern Hemisphere growers and certainly places where there's really good light and, and warmth. We're in North Yorkshire so we are <laughs> we don't have as much light as other regions. The temperatures are probably a bit cooler than other regions so aquaponics is probably not ideally suited for this type of region. However, when we decided that we were going to really push to do an aquaponic build, it was our dream really to be able to grow the healthiest, cleanest fruit and vegetables that we could grow. And there's nothing wrong with outside growing at all. This isn't going to be one of these videos where it's outside growing, is soil better growing, growing better than aquaponic growing. It's not going to be one of those videos. This is why we chose aquaponics. One of the reasons we chose aquaponics is A, for sustainability, because there's, well, initially you've got a lot more water going in, but over time there's far less water wastage and usage. Because it's inside, inside this tunnel, it's uh, protected from environmental pollutants yeah, a little bit exactly. more. Controlled environment. Controlled like environment. Temperature, humidity. Temperature, humidity, pests. Yeah. As we brushed on in one of the other videos, I started out experimenting with some little hydroponic beds at home, put a raft bed on the pond. Uh, my pond was already a well-established pond, good filtration system, well stocked with koi. Big koi. Big koi and goldfish. And then we started putting our heads together and then it came time for designing the system. Yeah, which, which you expect out. How does an aquaponic system work? This is a relatively small system, so this system was a little bit of a mishmash between different types of different types of growing growing, 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 system. growing system yeah so in this system we have obviously the fish tank for our fish because you need fish for aquaponics we have flood and drain beds and we have raft beds and or deep water culture beds yeah how right. does how does everything grow in an aquaponic system we'll start at the, at the start of our system and we'll just go through it and, and explain each step as we go through. So we start with the fish tank. We've got a thousand litre fish tank, uh, which is kept in an IBC tank. It's stocked with kois. The kois produce ammonia or nitrates from their gills and from their solid waste. This waste is then taken through a large particle filter, which takes out the big solids so it doesn't get into the system and clog it up. The finer stuff, moves on to our flood and drain beds. Now at this point you could put in a bio filter if you didn't want to run flood and drain beds but we really like the idea of flood and drain beds and um, they're very efficient great for growing deep rooted plants in and they act as superb biofiltration systems. So what this means is you cultivate good bacteria in these systems amongst the gravel in the stones and this breaks down the nitrates and converts it into nitrites which then travel through the rest of the system and reach the plants and the plants take up the nitrites as food obviously filtering this out of the water and the water is returned to the fish where it's lovely and clean and pure for the fish again and so the whole cycle starts again at the bottom end we've got the sump tank which is in the ground and then the highest point in the system of course is the fish tank and, it, and so we've got a, you've got a hill system where the water is basically flowing downhill. Yeah, it's important that you establish a good biofiltration system before you start growing. You need to allow time for the good bacteria to start to grow and to cultivate otherwise it's just not going to be able to break down the nitrates and convert convert it into good plant food. Yeah, when we started, we had, um, because, I mean, it's a 3,000 litre system, you've got about 1,000 in the sump tank, 1,000 in the fish tank, and, and about 1,000 in the five growing tanks. 
and we really struggled with the pH to start with. It was quite high. It was up at about eight to start with, yep. and we were having to treat it um, on a regular basis to get it under control. Mm -hmm. But as it's gradually settled in, it's settled down, and it's settled down now to about seven. I, would, I think it's down at about seven. If you're looking into aquaponics, learning about your pH levels is very important. Fish generally like pH around eight, seven and a half to eight, whereas your plants tend to like it a little bit lower, uh, the neutral range down to the six and a half kind of range. Yeah. So it's always finding that fine balance where the pH is ideal for fish and for the plants so that they're in harmony with each other. It would take normally um, a few months for your good bacteria culture to really start maturing um, before you can start growing. But we sort of cheated a little bit, didn't we? And we cheated in two ways. We introduced good bacteria that you can actually buy for filter start systems. And we also took liquid from our pond at home, which is really well established already. It's got a good biofiltration system and transferred some of that down in here and basically ran the system for a few weeks and allowed that to build up. And we didn't introduce all the fish in one go either. No, we, no. We, we, it was, from memory, it was about 10, ten a week or something for a few weeks. And yeah. We just gradually built it up. Yeah, that's right. Something that's important to consider when you're setting up flood and drain beds is the actual growing media that you're using in it. And there's mm. many, many options out there. You can go for clay balls, which are one of the most popular something we looked at but to fill each of our flood and drain beds is going to be 300 pound each in clay balls which we've got now each tank each each tank yeah which is which is absurd yeah. for us, wasn't it so we opted to use a type of stone instead or gravel fi finer gravel porous gravel is what you want because it allows the good bacteria somewhere to get into the crevices and you to want to talk about the, um, the acid content yeah so obviously depending on your region there's going to be different types of stone available to you. We went down to our local stone Agri aggregates merchants and we took 10 different samples of stone that would be suitable for our flood and drain beds. Out of those 10 samples there was only one sample that came back inert which means when it comes into contact with acidic water or liquid it didn't produce any kind of chemical reaction. What can happen is there's a lot of types of stone, once it comes into contact with uh, the acidic water, because it will be acidic because the fish are excreting ammonia, it can cause a chemical reaction which will start producing uh, carbon dioxide, um, which will completely throw your system's pH out of whack, um, which is something that you might not discover till too late. too late when you're way down the line and then it's a disaster. So we've ended up using um, a red, just like a red gravel. Yeah, a red a red decorative gravel. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's just 10 mil decorative gravel. So we did a simple test, and we took the the small stone samples, put it in a glass of water in a glass, and then poured in some white vinegar over the top and left it. If it fizzles and and you get a lot of bubbles coming off it, you know that it's no good for your system. If there's no bubbles coming off it, then it's fine. And then we went out and basically bought a dumpy bag of red gravel. Yeah. So went out, purchased the big um, dumpy bag of red gravel, Probably and obviously how much that was was it? It was cheap. It, it, was, it was about sixty quid or something. Yeah, yeah, sixty pounds in the end for a ton of the red decorative and, gravel. And we've used, I would think, what half, two, half of it. Yeah. yeah. So have we still used? No, in fact, that's not true. We've we've used the bag and a, and a bag and a half. Bag and a half. Okay. Yeah. So water from the fish tank is split. Half of it goes through a solid filter and then goes back into the sump tank. The second half of the water is then diverted into the first two flood and drain beds, which are essentially our bio filtration beds. The water that's in the sump tank is always coming back clean. So that water is split between going back into the fish tank, going through the system, and the other half of that water is coming into our deep water culture raft beds. These are basically just tanks that are full of water, the plants are sitting in net pots that are sitting on polystyrene boards, we've used insulation boards, I think the ones in there are 60 mil, the one that we got at home on the pond is 40 mil. I think that works quite well doesn't it? Works it? fantastic. And also we've got air stones in there as well providing the essential oxygen to the plant roots. 
and they're they're fantastic for any plants that are, are water hungry like like being in damp damp conditions and, and particular things that particularly like the aquaponics we did a lot of tests last year lettuces did all the lettuce varieties did really well for mm. we did we put a trial batch of celery in uh, we ran celery in aquaponics hydroponics and it all did amazingly well yeah i, I was quite shocked at how well it we did. we managed to grow things that we shouldn't have been able to grow in our first year of growing <laughs> yeah. we, did add, we did add some um, extra nutrients though didn't we minerals supplements that we put in there and we actually put some volcanic rock in the system um, fat rock powder. One of the questions we get asked is how do you know what the new, your mineral levels are in there? Um, we don't, we just have to rely on what the plants are telling us, you know. Learn to read your leaves. Yeah, if, yeah if read, <laughs> reading your tea leaves. <laughs> the leaves, obviously, um, different patterns for different deficiencies. deficiencies, yeah. And when you get it right, the original leaves that were yellow or whatever it was, they don't recover. You have to look at the new leaves that are coming through. Are they dark green? And, and so it, it probably takes, once you've adjusted it, it probably takes a month to, fix, to see if you've made any difference. So we, we also painted our, our grow beds like a nice dark green colour. That's just to cut down on the algae growth um, and also keep the water temperature a little bit more stable as well. Obviously, when you get sunlight hitting water, it's going to start greening up. So let's talk fish selection now. One of the, the tradition in South uh, Southern Hemisphere is, of course, tilapia. Yeah. Hugely fast-growing fish, really good to eat. Big fish, lots of nitrates off them. But the thing about uh, tilapia, they don't like water less than 20 centigrade. In North Yorkshire, we're lucky to to get to 20 centigrade. <laughs> I think we did. I think we got up above it a, a few days last summer, even even when it was like 35 centigrade. Yeah. You know, the water was starting to go up there and it was in the tunnel last summer, it got up to 50 centigrade. It was it was unbelievably hot. So we could we could use um, tilapia. tilapia. So we so went choosing fish for your region. Yeah, yeah. So we chose koi because we we both we know koi. We know koi. We know yeah. you know we could you know what they like. And, and to be honest, they've been in here a year. We haven't lost a single fish. No, no disease. No 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 problems. Because no. we know what the fish like. And koi's koi's for us were were an easy choice. They're hardy fish. They they accept tolerances that maybe some other fish wouldn't. Yep. They're fast growing, they're pretty. When you set up the aquaponic system, the idea normally is to grow grow your protein source, i.e. your fish, in conjunction with your vegetables. For us, it wasn't so much about eating the fish um, as it was so selling them, because kois are, a, are a, lo a lovely fish to breed and to sell. Well, there's a handful of goldfish in there as well. Yeah, there? there's a handful of goldfish. Go if you if you want to if you want to test your system out and you don't want to lose any fish, <laughs> you don't want to lose too much money. Start with goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> and they're happy in there. Are they? they are very happy. We've, we've actually got a fan tail in the bottom of there as well, <laughs> and he's very happy. He's got used to it. Yeah. And um, one of the things we um, we thought we'd try, we thought, you know what, we live close to the River Swale, so we thought trout. Ooh, yeah, trout's a good idea. We could, we, instead of Again, trout, fast growing. We found uh, a local uh, trout farm uh, about an hour's drive from here, and we went and picked up 50 trout. 50 now, blue trout. Blue trout, then. Absolutely. Beautiful fish. I'd never seen blue no, trout before. Uh, stunning fish. Yeah. And we brought them back and we introduced them into the big tank with the kois, and all was well for about the first week, really, wasn't it? But the trouble was that last summer we hit a grey patch and we couldn't make enough power to keep the air pump running and the problem was they need huge amounts of oxygen you're either going to have to fire 10 times as much water into there to suck the oxygen in, into the system yeah or you're going to have to have a huge water air, air generator yeah and unfortunately after about a week we killed all the trout and one night they, they literally all died one night so it wasn't it wasn't poisoning because the, the, the coys are fine, but it killed all the trout, yeah. which is an absolute disaster. Really. A little sad. sad. It sad. was really sad, really gutsy, yeah. because they were just exquisitely beautiful fish, and, yeah. they, and they seemed to be a real a real winner there, but we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't keep them. No. Could we with now? We've got a bigger system. I 
I probably might... still wouldn't want to risk it. No, maybe one or two in well, there. Yeah, yeah. Can yeah. I have a few in there? Yeah, just to Definitely. see if we can do it now. But but it was a it was a mistake. I mean, if you if you're not off grid, it's not an issue. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you can get mains power running everything, then you, you've got no issues because yeah. you you've got plenty of options. Yeah. Putting more air stones, yeah, it's yeah. fine. But it's for us, you've got to remember, you know, it's slightly different for us because we're off grid. So everything. So <laughs> yeah. So another thing to consider with with your fish again, we've kind of brushed on it was not overstocking your system with fish. Yeah. If you overstock your fish system with fish, if you've got too many in the tank, they're obviously going to get stressed out, they're not going to be happy. Again, they might be producing too much waste for your biofiltration systems to break down to the plants, so your system ends up just poisoning yeah, everything. So although air fish are in a thousand litre tank, that thousand litre tank is part of a three thousand litre system, yeah. which is all getting circulated. I mean, there's a lot of water moving in here. Yeah, and yeah. When all the pumps are running, monstrous amounts of water. Yeah. Another reason why we chose to go the aquaponic route in a polytunnel is for growing time for your vegetables. Because your outdoor growing is a lot more prone to temperature changes, there's no, there's no guarantee that you're going to be making crops um, in certain time periods. Whereas because the environment is a lot more controlled in here and the plants are getting the right nutrients all the time, really high oxygen levels to the roots, it means that the growing time for your crops is shortened yeah, quite great. a lot. I mean, the lettuces last year, once we got seedlings that are a lot like that sort of high, we, we transferred them into the gutters and into the flood and drain, the, the rack systems. And we were growing lettuces in four to five weeks. Yeah. I mean, it re and Quick that's turnover, it, and that, it? And that's, it, that's, that's Yorkshire. I mean, that, it, that's, it, yes, yeah. that is Yorkshire. Yeah. So depending on how big your aquaponic system is going to be, is going to determine the size of the pipework that you need to use that's going to transport that water around the system. Because we were using um, IBC tanks, because we knew roughly how much water uh, was going to be in the system, i.e. the total uh, literage in the system we knew that we were going to have to use a fairly big pipe size um, so we went for a 25 mil poly pipe uh, which is in the UK your standard underground plastic piping and um, so we get a really good flow rate on that it's well insulated as well it's which means wall. it's yeah. thick walled so it keeps the water temperature a, a lot more steady level and the you want to try and prevent quick rises and falls in, in water temperature and in presents system. UV getting through yep um, and greening up yeah, and then all your returns you did on you did on um, inch and a quarter. Yeah, and all all our return pipes are on uh, inch and a quarter push fit, aren't they? Again, so that we could change the system around if we wanted to. Uh, if your if your system's going to be absolutely set, you're not going to change anything. Then I'd go for glued fittings on your returns. Uh, but because because we chop and change at the moment as we evolve, we just went for push fit so we can move it around. And we haven't had any problems. No problems at all. Yeah, it's yeah. not pressurised coming back, is no, it? It's, it's purely yeah. gravity coming back. Something to consider, isn't it? Yeah. Your, your pipe work and how. And it, and it looks nice with white, white pipes. Clean. Um, yeah, white white gutters. Yeah. And then, obviously, the the uh, the oxygen supplies to the fish tank and the deep water culture beds. It's just normal four mil. Um, air pipe, mm -hmm. and we use exactly the same pipe for all the feeds in the hydroponics. You, you doing liquid feed, and then the air stones. How many air stones are we running at the moment? There, there's ten air stones in here. Okay. Um, uh, uh, the four, inch, you know, the four inch ones. Yeah. Um, so two in the fish tank, two in each of the racks, and, and two in the in the um, this pack. Right. So I think that just about covers how to set up a small aquaponic system today, a real quick overview of how, how it's done, how we've done it anyway. All right guys, thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Take care.